Our guest today is one of our favorites on the Suburban Women Problem. She's the author of the novel, The Daughters of Erie Town, and the memoir, And His Lovely Wife. She's also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and a writer of a column in the USA Today. Connie Schultz, welcome back to the Suburban Woman Problem. Thank you, Jasmine. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. We always enjoy having you on the show. So let's jump right in and start with kind of a big question. I don't know about you, but for me, everything right now feels overwhelming. Like we've had the pandemic, uh, we've got book bans going on, there's literally an entire war happening in Ukraine. How do we stay hopeful and engaged in this moment where everything just feels like it's just so big? Well, you're right. It is overwhelming. And I've been thinking about this a lot in the last few months, in part because I'm hearing this from so many uh, people, particularly women, of course, I think it's really important that we decide where we can make the biggest difference and focus our talents and our energy. Uh, If we look at the vast scope of everything that's going on, we can feel helpless pretty quickly, right? We can also feel exhausted. But if we can pick an issue or two that really matters to us, just one even, I think, for example, if it's book banning and you're worried about what your local school board is doing, that's where you invest your energy, right? To educate the public, to talk with state legislators. I mean, Ohio certainly has that going on right now. But the key to me is to find your place and stake your claim and then build out from there. I feel like I'm one of those people that whenever I see a fire, I want to run and put it out. But when there are so many fires, I realize that I'm just running all around with all these uh, buckets and there's just not enough water to put out all the fires. And last season when you were on the show uh, and we, uh, we asked about one of your great quotes and it's, quote, our energy is like a bank account. And we can spend only so much of it in any given day. So we need to invest it wisely. With everything that's going on in the world and in our country and maybe even in our local areas, what feels like a wise investment of your energy right now? And how has that changed over the past year? Oh, that's quite a question. Part of my energy expenditure is devoted to conversations like this with women like you and to your larger community of women. I've always had this sense of urgency about women and what women need, but the older I get, the more aware I am of it across generations, right? And that it, you've, oh, you've heard me talk many times about how we need to carry as we climb. And part of what my carrying is now is to make sure that I'm helping with, um, to create and participate in forums that enlarge and elevate the voices of women, particularly women who haven't necessarily had those microphones. For me personally, I have found that I'm like you, lots of buckets, pretty easy to do. And people get used to you being the person who's going to take another bucket, right? But if I stand back and evaluate just how effective I'm being, it's diminished returns after a point. And it's very hard for me to say no, but I'm getting better at saying not now. It doesn't mean I don't care about what you're asking of me, I can't do it right now because my students have to be a priority. As you know, I'm a professional in residence. I teach two days a week at Kent State, my alma mater, but it's always so much more than that because it's students and it's students who are who have been in a pandemic for two years. The writing matters to me a great deal. I have to be very flexible with my column. Like this week, I weighed in on Deshaun Watson, that horrible trade oh <laughs> that the Browns made. And, wrote, and I thought, I'm going to write it early, be done for the week, and then um, b- the beloved to me, Madeline Albright, right. has died. And my editor reached out and said, can you write about her tomorrow? How could I not? Right. She's an historical figure that I think we are losing a bit. We may be losing sight of because we have so many women in big positions now, right? And I want us to remember a moment when she was the big deal, period. So I have to pace myself. I've got a couple of books in the works. But the most important thing for everybody who's listening, including you, Ms. Jasmine, <laughs> is carving out time for yourself. We so easily feel guilty if we are, for even a moment, idle or doing something to take care of ourselves. I say this over and over again. I'm going to, it should be on my tombstone. She said, you need a break, (laughs) right? (laughs) You need a break. And um, we've used the metaphor before about holding the note as they do in choirs and in bands. When they're long notes, you can't sing all the way through. And we do staggered breathing. And sometimes it's got to be your turn to take a breath 
and we'll hold the note until you return. And the more we think like that in a sense of community and holding one another up and keeping one another strong, I think the, the more easily, well, it's never going to be easy, the more readily perhaps we will allow ourselves that moment, that time to take a breath ourselves. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I, I really needed to receive that right now because I, like you, also teach uh, twice a week. Uh Along with teaching twice a week, we have been in session. We are currently still in session. So I'm teaching, I'm in session. And it's not like this has been the easiest session because we've got some really bad bills coming through and, you know, just trying to constantly play defense and try to, you know, uh, stop these really bad things from happening. Everything that you just said, um, I felt but I felt all of that. I do think it's important for me to remember that in a community or in our choir, uh, that sometimes it is my turn to take that breath. Yes. And then I get back in so someone else can take their breath. And so that collectively the note is held, but everyone is still getting their opportunity to take their breath. And I think I forget that sometimes. I think I do try to hold the note the entire time and just tell myself, I can do this. I can do this. It's just not sustainable. It's not. And you've made me think of something else that we ought to talk about. Um, I'm older than many of the women who are going to be watching this. I'm older than you. I'm in my 60s, right? I wish I had comprehended this a lot sooner. There is this fear you can have when you're ambitious and you're trying to get a lot done, that if you start saying no, people will quit asking. I'm here to tell you that is not true. (laughs) There will always be another request. There will, you know, writers experience this a lot. Should I say no to this assignment? If somebody wants me to write this, the answer is yes. If you can't give it your best effort, if it's just going to stress you out so much that other things you care about are going to suffer, you can say no. And it doesn't mean that you won't have more requests, more invitations down the road. Well, I definitely receive that as well, because I do think I have that fear. I do think I have the fear that if I stop moving, then people are going to just move on from yes, me. Right. And um, I think that uh, that's a fear that we all have. I think it's in a, I think not only is it a woman thing, I think it's kind of an American thing where we kind of feel like we constantly have to be exhausted. And that's some type of badge of honor. And I really wish that we could move away from exhaustion being the goal and uh, be okay with not being exhausted. Exactly. And what you were just talking about, people walking by, if you stop, think of it another way, that you are being a role model for how that looks. You're, you're not giving up. You're giving yourself a break for just uh, you know whatever time you need. And maybe we need to be talking about that more. When we say we can't do something, maybe we need to explain. I mean, we don't know big explanations to people about our lives, but it could be very helpful sometimes to say, you know what? I'm going to take a pass on this right now. I have got to give myself some downtime. And I hope you're finding some downtime for yourself too. I definitely have. Sometimes my toast to joy is literally, I did nothing on (laughs) Saturday. How (laughs) wonderful. And it's like, you know, that might seem small to some people, but that's actually a really big deal to me to say, like, I did absolutely nothing. I did not crack open a laptop. I just sat around and did nothing. So, um, I cherish those moments. I will definitely say that. You recently wrote a column about a Ukrainian girl that was singing in a bomb shelter. And I know that since then, she's gone on to like sing in front of very large crowds in Poland. When you wrote that column, you said, every person fighting for Ukraine, every family ripped apart by this war, they grieve because they love. It can be kind of tough to lean into love when you've got those people out there that are just so hateful. So how can we be tough and fight back while also leaning into love and still loving people? This is an important question. I would never suggest that we're supposed to feel love for the people who are bringing deliberate harm to people we care about, right? When I talk about love in that column, what I'm, what I'm addressing is the universal language that regardless of our dialects or where we live, we all can understand um, how love can motivate us to do things that make us bigger and braver than we ever thought we could be. For me, it helps to remember that I, like Margie Taylor Greene, is is a hateful politician who is taking every top opportunity she has to inflict greater harm. I don't have to love her. I just don't need to hate her. 
when I think about what I love and who I love, the way I respond to people like that is to lift up the ones I am fighting for. Sherrod and I talk about this a lot at home that it's not, we don't really, it's not helpful for us and it's not healthy to think about what we're fighting against. It's who we're fighting for. And that helps keep us focused, right? And it keeps me focused in my column writing. I mean, when I wrote about Deshaun Watson this week, I was writing for the 22 women who have accused him and all the other women, all the survivors, not just women, the survivors of sexual abuse and rape who are wondering when are we ever going to value them and their stories. And when we're paying, when the owners of the Cleveland Browns are paying $230 million for this man, it helped me to get past my rage at the owners of the Browns and think about what are the women, who do they need fighting for them right now? I'm going to volunteer this day. And I reached out to the Rape Crisis Center and the donations keep climbing to them as a way to have an effective response. When I'm talking about love, that's what I mean. Figure out who I love. I love women. I love women who have not had the chance to speak out or who have found the courage to speak out. And we know what happens when they do in those circumstances. So that's how love gets me there, right? I am never going to pretend that I am capable of loving people who inflict so much harm. I'm just going to try real hard never to let them, never to hate them because I don't want to give them that that big part of my soul. I, I love that. I love the idea. We've, we've had a few guests on the podcast kind of say something similar where it can't always be about what you're fighting against. You Sometimes you really have to lean into what you're fighting for. And sometimes the message of what you're fighting for actually resonates a lot more than constantly being anti, anti, anti. It's like, what are you for? I've actually started to implement that more in a lot of what I do and the messages that I send to my constituents. When we have these bad bills, uh, I try to frame it in a manner of, you know, this is what I'm fighting for when I'm down here at the Capitol and I'm voting no on this bill. It's another way of saying, I will not give up on you. Right. I will not give up on what you need. I will not give up on, on the reasons you sent me. Right. Exactly. For you. I, that's how I feel as a columnist. I, I mean, I've been, there are certain issues I've been writing about for a long time. I will not give up on them. And I want, if nothing else, that's the message. And it's a positive one. I'm from Georgia and I get to talk about all the Georgia things on the podcast. And Amanda's from Ohio and you are also from Ohio. So I'm curious, the midterms are coming up. How can we reach suburban women in places like Ohio, where you live, to make sure that they're showing up and that they are engaged in this very, very important election season? Well, let's go back to what we were just talking about, having positive messages, right? Full of information, full of facts, spoken and delivered in a way that shows our respect for them as busy women in the state uh, who are necessary if we are going to bring real change. And that's what all of you have been doing so well. I mean, th- there's a reason your effort has taken off the way it has. And you're getting quoted more in national media because you're onto something. It always at its core is about respect. And we don't treat women as props. We don't view them as convenient. You know, we're not going to be here today to get them to vote and then abandon them. That's not how we talk. It's not how we approach it. I think that's the way we reach them. And we don't need to always be hair on fire, screaming about everything that's going wrong. What we need to do is help them feel the power they have to bring real change to the communities they care about. We want to empower people because that empowerment lasts past election day. You know, that empowerment is more than just show up to the polls. That empowerment is get involved. And when you're involved, yes. you that's that's not just, just voting, that's voting and. And I, I think that that's what we want to do You're a writer. Do you have any other novels in the works or have you been inspired to write any fiction lately or is reality strange enough? (laughs) Well, reality is strange enough, but fiction is a wonderful way to escape it for a little bit and talk about the reality that I see in my head. Um, I'm really excited actually about a couple of things. Uh, I am working on my second novel. The working title is Because You Asked, uh, and it, it builds on a relationship between a grandmother and her granddaughter in her 20s. Um, But what I'm also excited about, I have a children's book coming out, not this summer, but next. And it came about in such a funny way. I tweeted one day, you know, I think I'm going to write a children's book and call it Tom the Troll Has Been Blocked because I blocked so many trolls. Within an hour, my agent was on the phone and said, well, guess what? Razorbill Books, which is with Random House, 
is interested in a children's book about that. Yay. So the working title now is Lola Tames the Troll. And it's about a little girl and this boy who keeps dressing as a monster and holds up signs that are constantly harassing her and criticizing her. And at first she takes it to heart and then she finds her courage. And I really hope for two audiences here, obviously children who are bullied, right? Especially little girls, but also all those mothers out there who have really had it on social media with these trolls going after them because they'll get what the trolling is about. But it also has a very happy ending. I love that. I kind of want to read this book. It's now time to move on to our rapid fire questions. First question. So I know you cook to relieve stress sometimes. So what is your favorite dish to make? Well, we're vegans in this house and I love making tofu scramble. People would think, oh, I don't know. No, it's really good. And I always chop up some fresh vegetables in it. And then I add a little Tabasco. Sure, it's not big on the spices, but I got to have the spice. I love doing stuff like that. I like making healthy dishes that have a lot of flavor and I like cooking for my husband because he brings me breakfast in bed every morning when he's home. Oh, that's so sweet. I love that. I know it is sweet. Second question. What advice would you give to your younger self? Stay loud. I love it. I was always, I was criticized for having a loud laugh. I talked too loudly. Really what they meant is I talked at all. I would just wish I could tell young Connie, just stay loud. It's all going to work out. And boy, are you going to have a voice down the road. I would probably tell my younger self to stop talking yourself out of things because you oh. can do this thing. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. Next question. If you could swap lives with anyone in the world, who would it be? I am living a life of gratitude. I love my life. I, I love the people in it. I love, I've never felt more fulfilled professionally and personally than I do right now. So I'm, that's a hard pass for me. I'm going to just stay as complicated and problematic as I can be with all my flaws. I'm going to stay in the life I got. Love it. What's the last song you listened to? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this a little earlier today. I've been in a John Prine mood, but I'm not sure if it was um, All the Best or Angel from Montgomery. So if they made a movie out of your life, who would you cast to play Connie Schultz? Oh, I don't know. I know who I would cast for Sherrod. Um it would be Greg Kinnear. I have said this for years. He even looks like Sherrod. And I, Sherrod, I just watched um, from several years ago, right? But we watched As Good As It Gets. And he's in, I said, look at him. He looks so much like you. He And I know he could do your voice. And Sherrod just kind of looks at him and says, all right, if you say so. But he does. He looks like that. I have no idea who would play me. All right. So that is actually the end of our rapid fire questions. So um, I want to make sure that people know where they can go to find out more about you and your work. Well, I'm easily found at USA Today. If you, I think if you Google my name, it's the first thing that comes up. And that's where my columns are. And of course, my books are on Amazon and all the independent bookstore sites. Please, if you can use an independent bookstore. It came out during the pandemic. And I want to thank every single one of you out there who have bought my book or borrowed it from a library. It's wonderful to still get mail from people. Uh, it's wonderful to hear it's still being in uh, the subject for book talks and stuff. I couldn't have predicted that. It, it couldn't have come out at a worse time. And yet it feels like it was the right time now. Well, I'm so glad I got a chance to talk with you today, Connie. And thank you so much for your words of advice. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to take that breath. And I'm going to make sure that I carve out some time for myself. And, you know, as always, thank you for joining us on the Suburban Women Project. Well, thank you, Jasmine. And I'm going to be thinking about those buckets. I'm going to set a few down. So thank you for that. 